Good evening, I'm Jennifer Rooks here with Maine Public Chief Political Correspondent Steve Missler tonight. Governor Janet Mills delivers her first State of the State address before a joint convention of the Maine legislature. Steve, a little more than a year ago, it was her inaugural address. What do you expect to hear tonight? Well, I think you'll see tonight uh, Governor Mills basically building a lot, a lot off of a lot of the themes that she laid out and the initiatives she laid out in the inaugural address. And I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. We're, we're being told what's going on yeah. on the floor. I believe the Herald is announcing. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, Steve. So what do you expect? Do you expect big policy proposals tonight? I, I, I do some, but not a lot. I think because this is an election year and she has very little uh, wiggle room here in, in the politics of Augusta this time of year. You don't take too many big risks. That isn't to say there isn't going to be a lot of fighting and, and uh, as we record this right now, basically there's people chanting outside, drain the swamp. These are Republican activists in the hallway. So I think there's going to be a lot of that because Republicans are in the minority. They're trying to reclaim majorities here in Augusta because basically without that, they don't have much say in the policies that are being shaped here. And Governor Mills is probably going to try to uh, ex give out a, a message of bipartisanship, basically to say this is not Washington, D.C. And she has a perfect backdrop to do that because of the ongoing impeachment trial. That's and right. You know, and, and you did mention that right now Democrats are in control of the main legislature, both the House and Senate, but it's not a super majority, right? So Governor Mills does have to work with de uh, Republicans to get anything done. That's right. I mean, in some cases she does. If, you know, she wants to get out a bond package, for example, the, uh, that requires a super majority. But I think a lot of the initiatives you'll see tonight that she talks about will be uh, initiatives that could be put into a supplemental budget bill. We already have a two-year budget plan, but we're going to have a second one where this basically, it, sometimes they're used to plug but gaps in the budget. This one will be uh, basically an additional spending initiative. And in that case, she does not need Republican votes to pass that. Now, it might be behoove, it might be in her interest to get those Republican votes because it always is nice to be able to come out and say, we had a bipartisan budget agreement, but, but they don't need it. All right, well, we are going to go out to the floor Her here. The Herald is Governor announcing. Maine and the Commander in Chief, the Honorable Janet T. Mills, and the Chief Justice of the Maine Supreme Court, the Honorable Lee Ingalls Softly. Chair, it's pleased to welcome the Honorable Janet T. Mills, Governor of the State of Maine, accompanied by the Honorable Lee I. Softly, Chief Justice of the Maine Supreme Judicial Court. Of course, that's Senate President Troy Jackson at the rostrum announcing that Governor Mills and the Chief Justice Lee Softly are about to enter the room. Uh, first state of the state with a woman governor and woman Chief Justice, though Lee Softly has been Chief Justice for a number of years. Janet Mills now approaching the rostrum, smiling, shaking hands with, uh, can you tell who she's shaking hands with, Steve? Well, it's mostly uh, senators who have been brought to the front of the House well. Typically, the Senate is in another chamber, but this is a joint convention of the legislature, and so they're all together in the same chamber. In this case, the House chamber. It's the largest of the two. All right, and the, the hands she was shaking were Republican leaders, and now standing next to Speaker of the House, Sarah Gideon, receiving the applause as she waits to give her first State of the State address as governor. The chair would like to thank this evening's Herald, Air National Guard Technical Sergeant Daniel Pendergast. Would he please rise and accept the greetings of the convention. recognizing the Herald tonight. The chair would request the governor, Janet T. Mills, please step forward and address the joint convention. Governor Mills approaching the microphone. Everyone in the chamber standing in applause. I would expect to see some flourishes from Governor Mills here. She has a fondness for poetry, just as she demonstrated in the inaugural last year. I expect to see some of that here, too.
Steve, you heard there were a couple drafts of this speech. I did, yeah. I mean, I, it, you know, what's interesting is she really does take um, a heavy hand in, in drafting this. It's an interesting backstory into Thank how she you. got to this moment. Thank you. President Jackson, Speaker Gideon, Chief Justice Softly, distinguished members of the 129th legislature, and honored guests. I'm here tonight to continue the story of our state, to talk about the progress we've made, the challenges we face, and the strength and resilience of the people of Maine. To you, the people of Maine, those watching at home and in businesses and shops across the state, those who are working the second shift in Waldeboro, Wyndham, or Warren, those who are putting little ones to bed and making sure they have clean clothes and a lunch for tomorrow. You work hard. You get the job done. And you expect nothing less from all of us. You've entrusted us to put aside our differences and come together and do what's right. To protect your health care and make it more affordable. To create new jobs and expand opportunity to take care of each other and to welcome new Mainers home and ensure that our people are safe, happy, and have the chance to succeed. And you are counting on us to take action now on the climate crisis that threatens our very way of life. We've made progress, and we have done so without rancor or bitterness. Together, we enacted a visionary paid leave law, workers' comp reform, and important firearm safety legislation. Together, we restored the Maine Indian, Maine Indian State Tribal Commission and empowered it to become a forum for substantive communication, problem solving, and dispute resolution, critical work that I remain committed to. We successfully negotiated seven collective bargaining agreements in timely fashion with state employees that these agreements that provide cost of living raises, first time parental leave, and a long overdue wage study, and so much more. Our state is strong, our state is resilient, our state is ready. This year we celebrate our 200th anniversary as a state. After we separated ourselves from Massachusetts and embarked on creating our own corporate identity and destiny, we, the Maine people, learned to be self-reliant and at the same time to rely on each other. We carved our character and our living out of Maine's forests, hills, and tablelands, its fields and shores and mighty rivers. Using two-man saws in their own strength, Maine lumbermen withstood our coldest months to fell our tallest trees. Our state became the lumber capital of the world because of their resilience. Maine families dug potatoes, picked corn, squash, pumpkins, harvested oats and rye and side by side with their neighbors. Our state became the breadbasket of the Northeast because of the resilience of Maine farmers. Hundreds of Maine craftsmen each worked from dawn till dark and dusk and to build world-class boats and ships piece by piece. Our products reached markets oceans away because of their resilience. And of course, our state's history goes much further back before statehood to those who first hunted, fished, fished and farmed and set their stones on these grounds. We stand here today because of the resilience of Native Americans. Living in Maine has not always been easy. We have survived wars, depression, prohibitions. Okay. <laughs> Plural. We've survived booms and busts. We've seen hatred and bigotry. We've suffered loss as a state, as a family. And through it all, we've been lifted up by the courage, conviction, and resilience that comes from loving a place and its people. That resilience defines our history that resilience defines our future. These are trying times. Politics from Washington and beyond are marked by rancor, divisiveness, and fear. And during this volatile presidential election year, the noise is deafening, turning us away from the security and saneness of our own small outpost. 
Tariffs and trade wars, threats of terrorism and partisan fighting paralyze the nation's capital. But here in Maine, we're doing what Mainers have done for more than two centuries, putting our shoulder to the wheel and working across the aisle to get things done for Maine people. Because we're not Washington, we are Maine. Marked by strength, pragmatism, and resilience, Maine has always been ready and willing to do our part for our communities, for our country, for our world. We've always welcomed people who are not fortunate enough to grow up here, including ancestors of those of us in this room who came from other places. We've always faced loss together, mending our broken hearts as one people and one state. And for a moment, I want to bow my head with you to remember three good people who left this chamber unexpectedly in the past 10 months. People whose kindness and decency and dedication to this state left a mark on all of us. Representatives Dale Denno, Ann Peoples, and Archie Vero. Let us remember also Representative Jim Campbell of Sanford, who served in this body for many years and who left us this past week. May God bless them and may the memories of their lives bring peace to their families and wisdom to us all. This chamber is not alone in experiencing loss this past year. In April, a young police detective, a state police detective, was on a routine assignment when he stopped to help a stranded driver. While in that act of kindness, Detective Ben Campbell was struck by a tire that had spun off the axle of a passing tractor trailer, killing him leaving his community and his state shocked and in mourning. Tonight, Ben's wife, Hillary Campbell of Millinocket, is with us. Hillary and her young son, Everett, and the rest of Detective Campbell's family are a reminder of the risks taken and sacrifices made by our courageous first responders. Hillary, while we can never repay Ben or your family for his service and sacrifice, we will never forget him and we will honor his memory. Hillary Campbell. Detective Ben Campbell's name, I ask this body to enact legislation this session to increase the state's benefit for the families of our fallen first responders. The current benefit is shamelessly, shamefully inadequate to the sacrifice those of those who have given their lives in the line of duty. We ask so much of the men and women who answer the call to service, let's be there for their families in time of need. It's a simple thing to do, the right thing to do. We can do it because we're Maine, not Washington. On the morning of September 16, 2019, a call rang out. A truck responded. Within seconds, disaster struck. An explosion rocked the town and took the life of one first responder and injured many, including one who still lies in a hospital far from home. What followed was not only shock and grief, but an outpouring of support from all corners of the state to make sure that the town would be safe while the fire department, suddenly bereft of its finest firefighters, recovered. Our fire chief, Terry Bell, was severely injured and is still healing. And though we lost his brave brother, Captain Michael Bell, the chief is back, the picture of resilience. Chief Bell, I'm so glad that you and Denise are here with us tonight. 
I promise you and I promise the people of Farmington and the people of towns all across this state, we are going to make sure every department has what they need so this tragedy is never repeated. And we will make sure that every young person in our state understands the opportunity and responsibility that they have to give back to their communities. The spirit that heroes like your brother and Detective Campbell so selflessly embodied that you embody today. Thank you, T Chief Bell. In honor of Captain Michael Bell, I will create a scholarship fund for young people to train in fire suppression with the first contribution coming from my contingent account as governor. Maine needs more firefighters, particularly in rural Maine, and to that same end, I am proud to support Senator Aaron Herbig's legislation to fund the Maine Length of Service Program to boost retirement benefits to firefighters and EMS workers to compensate them for their service. We can do this because we're Maine, not Washington. Did I say that before? I'm also pleased to report to you tonight that Maine's economy is on a solid footing and growing. Revenues are up, our gross domestic product is up, housing starts, construction and auto sales are up, and the state budget continues to have a healthy surplus. Maybe you hadn't noticed that. <laughs> And while the private sector created 5,300 new jobs this past year, my administration at the same time helped 800 people with disabilities find and keep jobs. Our unemployment rate decreased from 3.5 to a historically low 2.8 percent. With your help, we paid off the $80 million debt for the Riverview Psychiatric Center and stopped the bleeding of interest payments to the federal government. My administration added $30 million to the Budget Stabilization Fund for a total now of $237 million. And Oh yeah, and we provided $75 million in property tax relief for Maine seniors, families, and small businesses. Just look in your mailbox. About 300,000 of you will be receiving a check. A check in the mail this week, thanks to the bipartisan budget passed last year and the good work of Speaker Gideon especially. While this is all progress, it's important that we remain cautious. The Revenue Forecasting Committee and the Consensus Consensus Economic Forecasting Commission, both have expressed cautious optimism about the Maine economy in the near term, recognizing, quote, the uncertainty surrounding national fiscal and trade policies that could impact future economic growth. Some economists also predict a looming nationwide recession in line with previous economic cycles. So we have to be ready for any downturn, any changes. We must remain resilient. That's why I'm committed to setting aside another $20 million for the Rainy Day Fund this year. Other challenges loom large over our economy. As any business in the state will tell you, it's difficult to find qualified workers and it's impacting their ability to do business. Very simply, we need people. My administration has developed a 10-year economic plan for the state with the cornerstone of attracting 75,000 more people to our workforce and fostering innovation. 
The goal here is to make Maine an international leader with a vibrant and environmentally sustainable economy, one that provides good paying jobs and an unmatched quality of life. Already we're seeing a turn in migration. From July 2018 to July 2019, we gained more than 7,500 people. It's coming. People who came here to find work, people who fell in love here, people who came from other states, other countries, from Canada, Cambodia, the Congo, and, below, and, and beyond, some at great personal sacrifice. Kifa Abdullah survived eight brutal years as a prisoner of war in Iran, facing death a hundred times over. Now, as a teacher and poet, he inspires students across the state with his story of survival and resilience. Kifa Abdullah joins us here this evening. Citizen joins us tonight. The author of a book, Call Me American, a young man who nearly starved to death in Mogadishu as a little boy before the U.S. Marines saved him and inspired him to learn English and ultimately to become an American citizen. Abdi Noor Ifton fled terrorism and sought refuge in another country and now lives and works in Maine, earning his college degree here. Abdi, you fought to get here, you belong here, and we welcome you here. Our new Welcome Home program is, is intended to entice those who've grown up here and left, and those from other states, other places want, wanting to move here, to come to Maine, become part of our workforce. We need them. But just look at the success of Tilson Technologies, led by Maine native Josh Broder. Tilson hires many, many veterans, and they are leading the world in innovative 5G technology, which is at the heart of our next industrial revolution. Tilson is here tonight, represented by Adri Adria Horn. Adria, are you there? <laughs> there she is. Thank you for what you do. people like Adria and Josh Broder to start their businesses here and expand their businesses here and to foster innovation. My administration will also support increased funding for the Maine Seed Capital Tax Credit. By helping businesses take root here and grow here, we'll create jobs and diversify our economy. And to encourage young families to come here and work here, Maine also needs more affordable housing. Assistant Majority Leader Ryan Fecto has proposed a Maine affordable housing tax credit similar to the Maine historic tax credit, which has helped boost our economy in recent years. That proposal would create nearly 1,000 additional affordable homes over the next eight years, increasing Maine's current rate of production by 50%. Send that bill to my desk and I will sign it. Our 
Our 10-year economic development plan also tells us to enhance critical infrastructure, including broadband, particularly in rural Maine. There's a place called Design Lab in Millinocket. It's a marketing and design firm. They used to have to upload their video files on a hard drive, hard drive, and then they'd drive to the Medway gas station where they would ask the bus driver to de deliver the digital, <laughs> digital files to a video editor in Presque Isle. That's no way to do business. Internet speeds for their business were dismal and severely limited, limited their productivity. Now, with broadband, they're succeeding. As one small businessman told me the other day, you want to grow the economy? Give me better internet. It's as simple as that. It's time for us to listen. High-speed internet is no longer a luxury, it's a necessity. Increasing access to high-speed internet will allow businesses to expand and allow people to connect with schools, healthcare providers, and markets across the country and around the globe. We also cannot let our state's economic advantages slip away in other ways. Our economy and our environment are bound together. This past session, we made smart investments in each. Thanks to, thanks to the collaboration of our administration and this legislature, including Senate President Jackson, the McCrums, a family who for five generations have harvested potatoes back to the 1800s. This year, they will open a large processing plant in Washburn, Maine, using Maine-grown potatoes and creating jobs, needed jobs in the county. The McCrums are the picture of readiness, of resilience, and we thank them. Meanwhile, on another front, two financiers, very creative individuals, Sam May and Scott Booty, created a first-in-the-nation credit union for farmers. The Maine Harvest Credit Union will help more farmers be successful and give a big boost to that farm-to-table movement that's become so important to our economy. Thank you, Scott Booty, for joining us here tonight. There we go. Also here tonight with us is Heather Whitaker. She's an alternative education instructor at Gorham Middle School, where I was once a student. She started a garden at the school where children are learning about growing food and about public service. And they donate more than, two, more than 800 pounds of produce every year to the local food pantry. Please join me in acknowledging Maine's Teacher of the Year, Heather Whitaker. <laughs> Just, <clears throat> let's not only acknowledge Heather, let's ensure that the students she teaches will have an opportunity to work with their hands and on our lands and fish our waters when they grow older. That means conserving our parks, our working farms, working forests, and working waterfronts. And tonight I call on this legislature to send to the people of Maine a bond that provides much needed funding for the land for Maine's future program. People overwhelmingly support this. People of all parties all across the state support this program. Let's give them a chance to vote, at least, on a measure that will protect our environment, protect our fishermen and farmers, and grow the economy. Well, we cannot have a healthy economy, of course, without a healthy workforce. And that's why my first action taking office was to expand Medicaid to provide health care to more Maine people. Now, more than 57,000 Maine people have accessed life-saving health care.
enacted LD1 to protect health care for Maine people regardless of age or condition or pre-existing conditions. Thank you for doing that. And we enacted prescription drug reform to lower prescription drug costs. Thank you for doing that too. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> and we provided more than $62 million over two years for nursing homes, understanding that that money should go to the employees, the direct care workers, to fulfill workforce and patient care needs. Well, there's more to do, <clears throat> especially for small businesses. Maine's small group health insurance market has seen increasing premiums and decreasing enrollments, making it difficult for business owners to offer insurance to their employees. That's why LD 2007, we introduced two weeks ago, sponsored by Senate President Jackson and Speaker Gideon, will improve health insurance for Maine people and small businesses, all without any appropriations, without any tax dollars. This bill, Made for Maine Health Coverage Act, offers a main solution for small businesses, and it creates a marketplace designed to best meet the needs of Maine people. I ask this body to pass that legislation on behalf of businesses like Becky's Diner. And I want to acknowledge one of the hardest working women I know, Becky Rand, who, <laughs> who is with us tonight. This legislation is critical to supporting their small businesses, businesses like hers and improving health care and strengthening our workforce. Thank you, Becky, for being here. brought some of those famous lobster rolls. I don't know. Maybe outside. <clears throat> we can do this because we're not Washington. We're Maine. Did I say that before? <laughs> and because we're Maine, we love our communities. We love our neighbors. But still today, too many of them are falling victim to another crisis that is harming our state. One I spoke about a year ago, the opioid epidemic. When I took office, I gave my word to Maine people suffering from substance use disorder that help was on the way. I told them and I tell them now they are not alone and together we'll do everything we can to bring them back, make our communities, our families, our state whole once again from this devastating epidemic. And because we expanded Medicaid, more than 6,500 people are now receiving treatment for substance use disorder who didn't have it before. Gordon Smith, Maine's first director of opioid response, is bringing the resources of the state and our expertise to bear on this problem, this public health emergency. Thank you, Gordon. Part of that mission is to make available the life-saving drug, Narcan. You know, when I was attorney general, I used funds from pharmaceutical settlements to buy Narcan, non-tax dollars, and I distributed it to law enforcement agencies all across the state. And Attorney General Aaron Fry has continued that work and as of, that, as of this month, that Narcan alone has saved 880 lives. Thank you, Erin. Through the new Prevention and Recovery Cabinet we formed and the Attorney General's Office, we're making sure that Narcan is more widely available. And we're training recovery coaches and supporting recovery centers across the state to help people turn their lives around and prevent it from happening in the first place. These efforts complement, of course, the efforts of law enforcement to stem the flow of dangerous drugs into and within our state. Meanwhile, Community leaders are also helping Maine people turn their lives around. 
Margot Walsh of Maine Works, who is with us tonight, is providing jobs to pe people in recovery. These opportunities, these second chances are critical to help people turn their lives around. And this effort helps us fill our workforce needs. It's a win-win for Maine. Thank you, Margot Walsh, for recognizing that Maine people in recovery are ready and able to work and that our economy needs their skills. Thank you. Make no mistake, healing our state from the ravages of the opioid epidemic is a complicated challenge and it won't be erased overnight. There's another scourge among us that we must eradicate as well, child abuse. No one can think about the past year without remembering 10-year-old Marissa Kennedy and four-year-old Kendall Chick, two helpless little girls who died violent deaths at the hands of family members whose caregivers were tried and convicted this past year. <clears throat> the deaths of these two children represented an awful failure of our society and of our state's safety net. Not to have intervened, not to have broken down the door, not to have saved those children was a sin of the highest order. And it is in the name, in the name of those children, Marissa Kennedy and Kendall Chick, that we have reactivated the children's cabinet to break down the silos of the bureaucracy that failed to hear their helpless cries. With the approval of this legislature, we've begun to rebuild the Child and Family Services Division. My biennial budget included funding for 32 new child welfare workers, and all 32 have finally been hired. Thank you to the Appropriations Committee for, for putting together a bipartisan bill on that in that respect. But you know, that was just a down payment. Maine's Child Welfare Ombudsman reported just last week we have more to do. We're on the right path, but a lot more to do. More than 1,300 children came into state custody last year, the majority of them under the age of five, majority of their homes torn apart by drugs. I will ask this legislature to fund another 20 positions to respond quickly and effectively to reports of abuse and neglect of our children. I know you agree. Our greatest responsibility is to protect the children and provide them with every opportunity to succeed. In our society, education is the pathway to success. <clears throat> and a key to addressing our workforce needs as well. Equal access to a good education levels the playing field for every student of every age in every zip code in Maine. And I believe in the Maine public schools. I believe in our state's 18,855 teachers who, like my mother did for 37 years, now devote their lives to making our children responsible citizens with skills to last a lifetime. So I am proud to say that in our biennial budget, we included $115 million in new state support for K through 12 and pre-K, bringing the state's share to nearly 51%. It paved the way for a $40,000 minimum teacher salary to ensure that our teachers don't have to leave the state of Maine to earn a living wage. It replenished the fund to renovate schools in disrepair, and it increased funding for higher education to keep tuition affordable. This year, I asked this legislature to fully fund the second year of the higher education budget that was cut last spring. These institutions of higher learning 
cannot withstand rising costs without the prospects of higher tuition. And higher tuition is the last thing our students need. The average Maine college graduate in 2018 owed more than $32,600 in student loans, the eighth, the eighth highest student loan burden in the country. We've got to simplify debt relief programs like the Educational Opportunity Tax Credit to help more graduates retire their debt on time. And we must boost the Educators for Maine Loan Forgiveness Program to incentivize young teachers to work here in Maine and work in underserved areas which desperately need them. We have a shortage of teachers. While lifting the burden of student debt off the shoulders of our graduates, we also need to ensure that secondary school students have the skills they need in whatever occupation they choose, the, need, the skills to succeed in a rapidly changing economy. We're joined tonight by one of those 18,855 remarkable teachers, Greg Cushman, another one, Maine's 2019 Career Technical Education Teacher of the Year. Greg is an electrical instructor and Skills USA advisor from Lewiston Regional Tech Center. Thank you, Greg, for training Maine's next generation of skilled tradespeople. And you know, our CTEs are more important than ever, yet they have not received significant funds for equipment since 1998. I ask this body to fund equipment upgrades for our CTEs so that teachers like Greg are able to provide the 8,000 CTE students with the skills that we desperately need them to have. These are great investments that will help us address Maine's top challenges, including our workforce shortage. Our workforce shortage, shortage is driving one of Maine's other top challenges, our aging transportation infrastructure. So while we're at it, <clears throat> In the words of my good friend and fellow governor, Gretchen Whitmer of Michigan, let's fix the damn roads. <laughs> oh, you love like roads. <laughs> Except in Washington County. <laughs> That includes Route 1 in Washington County, Marianne. <laughs> Just last week, the Maine DOT released its three-year work plan. Chronic under, underfunding and cost increases keep us from maintaining our essential infrastructure. With a shortfall of as much as $232 million a year, it's time to put our heads together and get creative. I want, a, I want that Blue Ribbon Commission to keep working on this until they come up with a good solution, as long as it takes. And this morning I signed the resolve you folks passed that allows them to continue that work. Partisan posturing and skinny mix won't fix the roads. Creative ideas will. And I'm not opposed to using some general fund dollars to improve uh, that infrastructure and to boost our economy and reduce greenhouse gas emissions through transportation changes. This is not a partisan issue. There aren't any Democratic roads or Republican bridges. We can fix this because, did I say, we're not Washington. <laughs> we're Maine. Galen Cole knew the importance of transportation in our state. Galen's transportation, his contributions to our state were immeasurable, not only as Bangor's mayor, but as a business owner, as founder of the Cole Land Transportation Museum, as a decorated World War II veteran, Purple Heart recipient, and as a lifelong champion for Maine's veterans. Members of his family join us here today, tonight, as we remember his legacy and honor him Thank you, Janet Cole Cross, for your father's and your family's contributions to our state's readiness, our state's resilience for the over 90 years of your father's life. Thank you, Janet.
I cannot speak to the state of the state or discuss its future without acknowledging another greater threat to the resiliency that is on a threat that is on our doorstep. As we speak this evening, as you know, wildfires are destroying far off Australia, killing every living thing in their path. The Bering Sea off Alaska is ice free suddenly, while drought is paralyzing Southern Africa. Maine is not immune from the damage caused by cli the climate crisis. Emissions of carbon dioxide and other heat trapping gases from the burning of fossil fuels, the unfortunate, quote, footprints of human activity stomping on the atmosphere, as, the, as NASA calls it, are impacting our economy, our health, and our safety. <clears throat> it may be easy for some of us to brush off the warnings of scientists on a day like today with freezing temperatures, when a one or two degree hike in temperature seems harmless, even welcome. Maine is strong, we're resilient, but we better be ready. Climate change is real and it is affecting us as we speak. Fishermen tell us of the invasion of green crabs from southern waters that are eating their clams and decimating their fisheries. Ticks, those little buggers, are now rampant. <laughs> and the number of, number of Lyme disease cases in Maine has increased four, tenfold in recent years. Some of our most beautiful towns built along lakes, rivers, and shores may soon become year-round flood zones. Sea level rise and storm surges in just a few years will threaten the causeways and piers, the shops and harbors of ho and houses of Booth Bay, Belfast, Rockport, Lubeck, and other beautiful communities. And you can imagine when we might have to redesign Route 1, a main artery of our tourism industry, to avoid constant flooding. I told the 193 delegates to the United Nations last fall, Maine won't wait. And I mean it. We're not Washington, we're Maine. <laughs> we, we can and will do our part. So this year, we've created the Bipartisan Maine Climate Council. We became the 22nd state to join the U.S. Climate Alliance. We've committed to achieving 80% renewable energy by 2030, one of the most ambitious renewable energy standards in the nation. We've opened the door to offshore wind projects, supported electric vehicles, and promoted the installation of heat pumps statewide. We've removed the cap on community solar and fixed net metering, and now more than 300 new solar projects, community solar, are in development. From a fisherman's co-op to a capped landfill in Tremont to the Hope General Store, the Milk House in Monmouth, food pantries in Vassalboro and Saco and credit unions, apartment buildings and trailer parks, water districts, super cuts in Brewer. And the farmland in Franklin County and Geiger Brothers in Lewiston. Solar energy is changing the landscape and saving money for people all across the state. And at the Blaine House alone. <laughs> the new array. <laughs> that new array of solar panels has already saved the equivalent of one ton of carbon dioxide emissions. And in the coming year, we'll continue to move away from oil as primary source of heat, renew, reduce our reliance on gas for transportation, we got to, which is 54% of our greenhouse gas emissions. We'll support innovative businesses like Atlantic Sea Farms, run by Brianna Warner, that they grow kelp commercially, <clears throat> diversifying our aquaculture economy while reducing ocean acidification. We'll embrace, we'll, we'll embrace energy storage and other new technologies. And meanwhile, all along the Northeast United States, the offshore wind industry is generating thousands of jobs in the development of thousands of gigawatts of renewable electricity. According to the International Energy Administration, offshore wind is set to become a $1 trillion industry by 2040. Maine won't be left behind. For centuries, the Gulf of Maine has sustained Maine life from the time humans first migrated to Maine, the bounty of the sea and the shore have been a critical part of our sustenance. Food, transportation, communication, recreation, all have been gifts of the sea to us. For Maine people, the salt is in our veins. But today, the Gulf of Maine is in trouble. 
warming more quickly than nearly every ocean in the world. The Gulf of Maine's ability to sustain its rich and diverse resources is diminishing. Cod, herring, shrimp, and lobster are some of the staples of coastal life already at risk. We cannot wait to act. We're already fighting for our lobstermen and fishermen, yet the Gulf of Maine is both a challenge and an opportunity. It is our new frontier. No, not for oil, but for wind. Thanks to this legislature, the Public Utilities Commission, and our university, Maine will build and launch the first nation's first floating offshore wind project, Maine Aquaventus, with full input from our fishing industry and our people. And I promise you that commitment is just the beginning of our effort to use the Gulf of Maine and all the world's oceans to slow the warming of our planet. We can do this. The University of Maine Advanced Structures and Composites Center, led by Dr. Habib Dagger, has already created the first grid-connected floating offshore wind turbine in the United States. And Maine Aquaventus is positioned to become a leader in this industry. Thank you, Dr. Dagger, for putting Maine on the map. If you haven't visited that laboratory, you must. It is amazing what they're doing there, and our engineering students are helping every step of the way. This spring, I will visit Scotland to see the offshore wind platforms that they're using to supply that country with clean, renewable energy. I'm determined that the business we once lost to them, we will bring back to Maine. We have such great potential, and in the coming weeks, my administration will be taking steps to unleash that potential. Stay tuned. <laughs> Mitigating the effects of climate change and moving Maine toward a clean energy future requires that our utilities be reliable and resilient as well, and that they put Maine consumers first. <clears throat> For years, we have allowed electrical utilities a monopoly on our transmission and distribution lines. Today, few are happy with the results of the regulatory framework under which these utilities operate, based primarily on setting rates that allow a reasonable profit to the utilities with very little degree of benefit to the public. I ask your guidance and your help in this body to make sure that these foreign corporations to whom we exceed the privilege of operating in our state are answerable, answerable to Maine, not to Spain or some other foreign country. Let's work together to ensure that Maine consumers are at the table, that profits do not take precedence over service, and that utilities are accountable and answerable to the people of Maine. Stories of Kifa Abdullah, the Farmington Fire Department, Tilson Technologies, Abney Noor Ifton, Becky Rand, Margot Walsh's clients in recovery, Heather Whitaker, Greg Cushman, and Galen Cole, and others. These are stories of resilience, readiness, preparedness. These are stories of Maine. They're stories that Maine's first governor, William King, might have relished. As I reflect on the spirit of Maine people in this, our bicentennial year, as I think about our history, I wonder what our predecessors would think about where we are today. I wonder what Governor King, William King, saw when he traveled the state 200 years ago. Did he see eagles flying over the Kennebec? The same prehistoric sturgeon we now hear leaping in the waves? The tall, elegant pines, the brightest salmon fields newly cleared of stone? middens on the islands left by Native Americans thousands of years before, the tall rock of Seguin beckoning fishermen and sailors home. And could he have imagined, 
Could he have imagined the wonders of the modern world of the new heights that we have reached? Could he have dreamed that a young woman from Caribou, Maine would be speeding through outer space at this moment, having achieved history by completing the first all-female spacewalk? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica Meyer, wherever you are, for being a hero to young girls and boys from Maine and proving that the sky is, in fact, no, no longer the limit. Jessica is another example of readiness, of Maine-bred resilience. And what would Governor William King think of our clothing made in China or, or a delivery service called Amazon? Would he think of the growing, what would he think of the growing tech sector or the digital age or cybersecurity or Russian hackers? What would he think of cars and cell phones, of Uber, Lyft, and Air and Airbnb? Would he have given up sending letters from Maine for Snapchat, Snapchat, Instagram, or Twitter, or Facebook? And what would Governor Carl Milliken of Island Falls, the first governor to live in the Blaine House 100 years ago, what would he think of us now? Well, be a mixed bag. <laughs> 100 years ago, on the heels of national prohibition, Governor Milliken spoke about the impending vote on women's suffrage. Opponents had gathered 10,000 signatures to force a referendum and block the right to vote. In his speech to this body, Governor Milliken said unequivocally, quote, if only one woman in Maine wants to vote, she ought to have the chance, end quote. <clears throat> this <laughs> This year, the legislature could take one more step in the direction of full citizenship, full responsibility, and equality under the law. After decades of debate and 46 years after Maine ratified the Equal Rights Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, it's time to do what 26 other states have done, preserve equality of rights regardless of sex, pass the Equal Rights Amendment to the Maine Constitution. As Justice Ginsburg said, quote, I would like my granddaughters, when they pick up the Maine Constitution, to see that language, that women and men are persons of equal stature. I'd like to see that, like them to see that it is a basic principle of our society. So pass the ERA. Now, Governor Milliken was also concerned about intoxicating beverages. There yeah, we may differ. So he and Neil Dow would probably roll over in their graves to learn that Maine now has 153 craft breweries, more breweries per person than any other state. <laughs> well, breweries. A lot of jobs, a lot of jobs. And I would want to reassure Governor Milliken unequivocally that my election 14 months ago had nothing to do with a fourfold increase in beer consumption in my home state. <laughs> well, what will our state be like 20 years from now, 50 years from now, 100 years from now? Will artificial intelligence replace books and normal communication? Will we, not, we have digital codes instead of names? Will facial recognition replace the handshake? I can't say for certain what the future holds, but 50 years down the road, I predict there will be data centers across Maine buried in granite, cooled by geothermal cells, providing enough spin-off heat to run a whole town for an entire winter. Skyscrapers and homes across the country will be built with cross-laminated timber, invented and manufactured here in Maine. <laughs> Uh, 
And I predict that John L. Martin will be back in the state Senate after having been term limited seven more times between the two bodies. Dana Dow will have sold his 1,000th leather recliner, recliner. And in Freeport, Ben Gideon will finally run for town council. <laughs> and Sawin Millet will be serving in his 49th cabinet post for his 38th governor. <laughs> L.L. Bean will still be selling great boots delivered by robots. They'll be good for spending a weekend hiking on the moon. <laughs> Visitors will be flocking to Westbrook this time of year to see the formation of yet another ice disc <laughs> spinning on the Presumpscot River. There will be high-speed passenger rail from Freeport to Lewiston and all the way to Montreal. <laughs> We'll finally have high-speed internet all across the state, and maybe even cell phone service on 295. <laughs> and the governor of Maine, whoever she is, <laughs> will be making $70,000 a year. Don't you laugh. <laughs> but know this, everyone will want to live here. Everyone will want to stay here. We have an ambitious agenda this year, years to come. And I know there'll be people who'll say, we can't do all of this now. And you know, government should do less, not more. Building a health care system, saving people from the opioid epidemic, fighting child abuse and domestic violence, confronting climate change, strengthening education, improving our workforce. Is this too much to ask? Former Speaker of the House Tip O'Neill once said, quote, any fool can tear down a barn. It takes a good carpenter to build one. We can do these things. We're not Washington. We are Maine. <laughs> Let's build a barn that shelters our state, that protects our stock and feed and flock, that keeps the evils of the world at bay, makes our state resilient for centuries to come. 150 years ago, General and Governor Joshua Chamberlain addressed this body. He said, quote, government has something more to do than govern and le levy taxes. It is something more than a police to arrest evil and punish wrong. It must also encourage good, point out improvements, open roads to prosperity, and infuse life with, into all right enterprises. I think he meant build a barn. 200 years ago, we secured our independence from Massachusetts and became a state, though we divided the country in some unholy compromise. But today, we set a course for the next decade, the next centennial. Like the pulse of our common community, the water beneath the now-crusted ice flows deeper than ever, hiding the strength and richness of our rivers, our state's lifeblood. The mountain peaks boast snow, the high pines that once attracted shipbuilders, and the spruce whose roots secure the granite along our shores are certain now of surviving another winter sheltering the land for many more seasons to come. We are but a minute in the course of centuries, but these things will surely be here 50 years hence. Ready, resilient, strong, and unchanged. Like, like them, let us preserve what we can and build what we can, when we can, however we can, of this great state in this our bicentennial year. And to all the people of Maine, Thank you for the great honor of being your governor. Governor Janet Mills wrapping up an emotional and um, relatively long first State of the State address, an hour address. Um,
lengthened, I believe, by the um, multiple rounds of applause, Steve. We were told it would be a 40 to 45 minute speech, but uh, I don't think she counted in so many times. Everybody in the legislature standing and applauding for many of the um, people she recognized and initiatives she proposed. Janet Mills had a theme throughout her speech, which was, we are not Washington, we are Maine. It's sometimes seeming to sort of crack herself up with the repetition of that. And also um, some rhetorical flourishes, especially around the state's bicentennial. Steve, as you listen to this speech, did you hear anything that you didn't expect? You cover the governor day in, day out. You know what she's proposed. Was there anything new? Well, there were a couple of uh, things that I anticipated, but um, there were not not too many big surprises outside of the fact that there seemed to be an, almost a warning or a shot across the bow against central main power, which has been in the news a lot lately. Um, its brand has um, taken a hit over the last couple of years because of uh, power outages and restoration efforts, and of course this billing uh, issue that's continued to follow them uh, for the last couple of years. Um, the, there was that. There was also um, uh, the uh, commitment to adding resources at the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, specifically its Child Welfare Services Division, which has also been in the news a lot lately, and for all the wrong reasons, uh, two tragic deaths of two young girls that have also been um, a subject of litigation. Uh, those were not terrible surprises, um, and nor was the this overarching message of we're Maine, not Washington. This is not necessarily a new uh, sort of uh, trope to use, I guess, uh, to, to compare Maine, which has a reputation of sort of working together. But there are times when that rep reputation is just that. It's not the reality. It's not that long ago where we had bitter fights in this building. Uh, we had a state government shutdown. And there were a lot of uh, references to those years in her speech, although uh, the person that I think she was alluding to was never spoken. And never that was once named. Never once named. That he, he who shall not be named. And that was Governor Paula Page. Um, he was he is constantly brought up in here without being named. And that also includes this recommitment of hers to uh, offshore wind. If we recall, there was a Aqua Venice project uh, by the Univers University of Maine that Governor Paula Page um, scuttled. Uh, and, and so that, that uh, proposal and uh, basically, is gonna be, she's saying that should be coming sure, back. Sure, offshore wind, she made a point of saying she wants to have another bond uh, for land for Maine's future, as well as um, talking about the lives saved by Narcan, all issues putting her in contrast with former Governor Paula Page. We're also joined now by University of Maine Farmington political science professor Jim Melcher. Jim, thanks so much for joining us tonight. My From pleasure. your um, political scientist uh, lens, what did you see tonight that, that surprised you that you noted? Well, I, I'd echo a lot of the things that Steve said about the contrast about LePage without mentioning it. Stylistically in watching the speech, it was very different. There wasn't the sort of anger calling out specific people. In criticizing Washington, the ch criticisms are very general, more of a contrast. One of the things that she's been criticized for on the left of her party is not talking more about changes in the tax system, talking about those kinds of inequality things, the kinds of things that, say, Bernie Sanders has talked a lot about. I think you could take that this is Maine and not Washington logic and in some ways contrast it to the presidential campaign that we've been seeing. There were certainly talks about helping those in need, certainly those in need of help from the opioid crisis and so on, but there wasn't the kind of emphasis on inequality that really has been the major theme of the Democratic presidential campaign. Um, it was talking about spending specifically to help business in so many cases. This will help business. Broadband will help business. That it wasn't the kind of angry language about business we've heard so much of nationally. It was, we want to help business. Government has a role in doing this. But then she also, much like Democrats nationally, put a big emphasis upon environmental issues in a way that's a tremendous contrast uh, to the governor. I thought it was a practical speech. I don't think this is going to go down as a memorable speech in terms of oratory, but I thought it was an extremely well-crafted speech in trying to come up with things that she could get people from the other side of the aisle to support. It was very practical. You could see her excitement. You could see that she had a sense that this was an important moment for uh, a woman to be speaking for. 
was interesting in the page, though, also, is Paul LePage did mention specific Democrats that he was glad he had worked in. There was very little, I'm not sure she mentioned Republicans more than once or twice specifically. So that was different. Mentioned Sarah Gideon a lot, I think, trying to help publicize her in the Senate race. Um, but I thought it was an effective speech, if not necessarily one that uh, will be remembered 20 years from now. And, and Steve, emotional at times when she talked about uh, the trooper, Ben Campbell, um, and introduced his widow and also Chief Ter Terry Bell, um, who stood to an, a very emotional round of applause. She's talked about increasing the benefit to families of fallen um, firefighters and, and police officers. I did, had not heard of that before. Is that the first you've heard of that? That is the first time I've heard of that. And of course, this goes back to what we were talking uh, about at the very beginning of the speech, or just before it, which is that all of these initiatives that she talked about that cost money will come in another thing that she didn't mention tonight, which is a supplemental budget. It was never mentioned in this 28-page speech, an hour-long speech. Um, but that will be a proposal that will be coming forth shortly, I would imagine. And that's how these initiatives, such as the survivor's benefit, uh, the additional uh, caseworkers at uh, the uh, DHHS and Child Welfare Services, all that must be done with, with money. And that will come through this supplemental budget plan, which you know hopefully we'll see very shortly. Jim, did it strike you that twice she singled out immigrants and um, called attention and had them stand um, in the balcony for attention? Very, very much so. And she, she had particular people. I think she chose stories well. I think she chose immigrants with stories that are a contrast to those who criticize the people who've come here. Look at these people that have fought against tyranny. They embody American values. They're hardworking. They're productive. They're just like the people we had before. I thought that was one of the most effective uh, portions of her speech. It isn't necessarily calling for a specific policy proposal. And really, a lot of her speech wasn't talking about specific policy proposals. She had a very long digression about what would the people of the past look at us now, I'd say it was more on some of those broad themes and how we look at our state, more than the average state of the state would be. But I thought the refugee section was very effective on her part. Uh, to, go ahead, Steve. Yeah, to Jim's point about uh, some policy sort of mentions without any specifics, transportation funding. Mm -hmm. She starts with quoting a governor from another state saying we, we need to fix these beep roads. Um, but doesn't say how she wants to do that specifically. Um, that leaves a lot of options for lawmakers to consider, which they've been considering for a long time, because we have become reliant on bonding, going to voters to approve bonds. There was no mention of what she would, would like to do specifically in that speech to, to, to move away a little bit from bonding, except for increasing revenues in the, in, in the budget, or dedicated revenues in the budget versus, say, you know, a gas tax increase, or even restoring indexing, indexing, which went away in 2012, if I recall correctly. Was there anything? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Well, it wasn't specific, other than specifically talking about US-1 in Washington County and pointing out the particular person in the audience who wanted to hear it. I think she really was calling them out in a certain level. Mm. She was challenging them, saying, look, you've got to, it was one of the most confrontational sections of the speech in saying, you've got to do something about this. Maybe that's tactically wise and not wetting herself to a particular proposal. But uh, there was a little bit of sense of, I'm not totally confident you're going to move on this without a prod. And I thought the tone she had in that section of the speech was, was important. Oh, and Steve, I wanted to ask you, was there anything you expected her to talk about that she did not? Were you surprised um, yeah, no, by omissions? No, not really. I mean, I do, I do think that uh, the section on health care, which has been such a focus for Democrats, not just in Maine, but nationally, this is you know, health care and uh, access to it has been a huge issue. It was helped fuel the 2018 wave election, which helped put her in office. Um, and also, of course, uh, Democratic majorities in the legislature, too. She did talk about it a little bit, but she didn't uh, home in on it for an extended amount of time. 
Um, but that does that, but that's probably because the proposal she's already uh, come pu become public with a proposal to merge the indi uh, individual and small group insurance markets, and that may get some bipartisan support. So maybe not focus so much there. All right. So um, pass the ERA was part of this speech um, on the heels of the Virginia legislature uh, voting to pass the ERA. Jim, is there um, support in the state of Maine for this? I suspect that there is. I don't know whether. Now Nationally, it's going to matter. The constitutional amendment proposal did have a time limit, uh, but it certainly is something that I think, you know, Maine passed it many years ago, was relatively quick to do so. It's a more partisan issue now than it once was. At the time that Maine passed the ERA before, Richard Nixon supported the ERA, Gerald Ford supported the ERA, the Republican platform supported the ERA, but I think a lot of the more moderate Republicans in Maine would as well. But I would be skeptical of its ability to pass on a national basis, but it's no surprise that Janet Mills, who's always been uh, tied to uh, feminist approaches to politics, the power of women in politics, that doesn't surprise me at all, especially in the wake of the momentum they feel they've seen in Nevada as well as Virginia in the past week. All right, well, Steve, wrap it up for us. What is the significance of the state of the state, significance of a state of the state address? Is this a roadmap to the next year? Is this a, yeah. um, a cheer? <laughs> what, what, how would you characterize? Yeah, I think it's a bit of tonight? a clarion call, to not just uh, to her, for her administration, uh, Democrats in the legislature. Let's not forget that Janet Mills has a lot riding on the upcoming election because her agenda could effectively stall if, say, the Republicans you know, take back one chamber or both chambers. Uh, in November. So there's a lot riding on it. And this is sort of a roadmap, as you put it, um, and a clarion call, I think, uh, to remind Democrats that this is what you stand to lose if, you know, if we don't retain majorities here. All right. And um, in November, the entire House up for re-election. And the Senate. And the Senate. So a lot of uh, attention to the presidential race, of course, this year. But here in Maine, um, a lot at stake as well. Um, Steve Missler, Maine Public Chief Political Correspondent, thanks so much, of course, for joining us. You'll be back in just a little bit. And um, uh, UMaine Farmington Political Science Professor Jim Melcher, thank you so much for joining us here at the State House today for the Governor's State of the State Address. My pleasure. I'm going to toss it now to Mal Leary, uh, Senior Political Correspondent for Maine Public, who is here with Republican leaders for the Republican response. Thank you very much, Jen. With me is the House Republican leader, Representative Kathleen Dillingham, and the Senate uh, Republican leader, Dana Dow. Representative Dillingham, let's start with you. When you heard the governor's speech tonight, there were many items with price tags. Mm -hmm. uh, no one knows exactly how much yet. It's going to take a while to add it all up, but it's certainly millions of dollars. What's the Republican position? You've been saying for weeks now that there's too much spending going forward? I, our position is not necessarily too much spending, but if um, we do have revenue <clears> forecasts, <throat> and if we're not going to return that revenue back to the main people, then we should be making sure we set our priorities and looking into um, future budgets, um, maybe funding um, existing issues we have here already and not looking at funding um, new um, programs, especially with some of those forecasted revenues are one-time funds. We've talked about our infrastructure. I was, I was happy to hear her say, you know, let's fund our roads. You know, let's take care of them. Um, you know, that, that's something that we should look at, making sure, um, think outside the box, not just look to a gas tax and not just look to bonding to always taking care of our, our infrastructure. I'm glad to hear her men mentioning nursing homes and direct care workers as well. That's something that we believe is a priority. Senator so Dow, that we're talking about some bond issues there, Land for Bay's Future, which had some support in both Republican caucuses last year, but it never really got there because of disputes on other matters. Do you think there could be votes to pass the Land for Maine's future bond? I think the uh, disputes had to do with the total amount of spending, and uh, we didn't want to continue to add to it at that time. Uh, however, uh, Lands for Maine Future is a very popular program with many people, and, and we do support uh, monies for that. Uh, however, um, being a businessman, I always want to uh, support a spending that has a return on its investment, and I want to see the things that we do grow the main economy 
uh, more than just what's happening now. Uh, we're, we're growing because of the national growth is also affecting us. And we need to put a big effort into further growth because we've, uh, because of the brain drain we've had over the last two decades, uh, losing 70,000 students from K to 12, plus their parents that moved out of state uh, to find jobs elsewhere. We want those people back. So uh, investments need to help uh, businesses which support all these jobs. We want job growth as much as anybody. We want to bring these people back to the state of Maine. How are Republicans working with the governor on some of these issues? I mean, some of these issues that we're talking about have been around for months. Uh, the talk of the Land for Maine's Future Bond has been around. Investment in uh, broadband internet has been around. Is there any efforts by the Republicans working with her and the Democrats? We need to make sure that uh, we keep the avenues of communication open. Uh, and that needs to be an improvement from both sides. My, myself, um especially when you're talking about broadband. I sat in um, with a meeting with the governor and um, people from the industry and we talked about, again, thinking outside the box in the way that um, we fund broadband and looking is there a way to probably um, put that in part of the budget and not necessarily just bonding it out and also how, um, how that money is going to be targeted, how it's best spent across the state of Maine. So it, the conversation on that um, particular item has been good. There seemed to be broad applause, at least from what I could see on the TV monitor, uh, from both sides of the aisle for additional caseworkers in the Department of Health and Human Services. Is that got the support, even though it's probably got a million dollar plus price tag? Personally, I, I know my caucus is going to want to see the details. Um, again, I, I think that's something that it's important that the wraparound services are there as well. It's not just the caseworkers. Um, you can have, fill all the caseworkers in the referring, but if they don't have the wraparound services for the family, you know, those need to exist. So uh, I'd like a little bit more details about the proposal for the additional positions and in totality what that's gonna look like. And uh, I would agree. Uh, when I look at uh, that type of spending, I'm looking towards uh, also a long-range outlook, too. Uh, some of these people, if we can help them with their education and get them a good job, that'll take care of a lot of the problems that they have. And I'm looking forward to that, to that type of spending. Like I said, a return on investment that uh, invests in the main people, not to just give them a handout, but to make sure that they can take care of themselves in the future. Some of the things she talked about were not spending in the sense most people look at it. They were tax credits. One of the tax credits is to try to address the very problem you're talking about, Senator Dow. The problem with that, of course, is it reduces the amount of revenue coming in if you're giving a credit. Is that something you're willing to look at? I am. Uh, tax credits seem to say to me taxes are too high already. We have to give a credit for certain types of businesses to encourage them to grow. Uh, I look at a North Carolina plan where they have reduced taxes over a series of uh, six to eight years and added 750,000 people to the population. That's been a successful plan. Those are the type of plans that I would like to pursue. And in the House. Um, along the same, and just, uh, talking about tax credit, I'll jump over a little bit. Um, referencing the $100, or I think it's $104 that people are going to be receiving, um, and, and that's wonderful. I, I, everybody can use uh, every penny that they can get, but the bill that was passed was passed under Republican leadership, and that was set up um, to create a fund to try to reduce um, our income tax. And rather than benefiting just people who have the opportunity to qualify and file for homestead exemption and income tax for our caucus believes would have been um, much better used to try to reduce income tax and, and to address many more Mainers that, that way. So I think it's always, it's in the devil's in the details when you're talking about tax credits. You need to look at um, what programs you're talking about, who's going to be receiving them, and what's the incentive and what's going to be the return. Is that a tough sell though? Because the property tax is what people complain about most, 
when you go door to door, at least that's what I've heard. Um, we also addressed the property tax. Uh, House Republicans, along with the Senate Republicans, fought to make sure that um, we re reinstated the um, homestead exemption that was cut in the, um, the amount that was cut in the budget proposal. Um, we also dealt with um, other pieces for um, the property tax. So, and I think I think the governor re uh, referenced that in her speech, and that was certainly a bipartisan effort. Eventually, but it was something that the Republicans were happy to um, try and push through the budget. Senator Dow, one thing new that we hadn't heard about before tonight was a state equal rights amendment going in the state constitution. Your first blush. Uh, thoughts on that? The equal rights to me are, are the most important things that we have. Everyone should have equal rights. There is no excuse for anything other than uh, total equality. Representative Dillingham. I believe we have them. Um, I don't think the question is putting it into our constitution. It's not gonna, if you treat me differently because I'm a female, if you pay me less because I'm a female, if you disrespect me because I'm a female, putting that piece in a constitution is gonna change that. That has to be um, changed in, in society. And I, I won't go into it tonight, but if certainly there's, especially in my position as House Republican leader, I've had many instances where I am treated different because I'm a female. Nothing's going to change that if that's somebody's, um, you know, if they, it's how, what they believe. They think that, that I deserve to be differently, be treated different because I'm a female. So um, I would not support that. Is there something you particularly liked that the governor brought up tonight? I, I like that, actually, the, the overall feeling and pride in the state of Maine um, and for the people of Maine. I think that's something that we certainly all have. Um, she mentioned many times that, you know, we're not D Washington, D.C., we're Maine. And I believe that's true. I think that we can um, work towards compromise. There are certain things that um, we certainly are never going to agree on. Doesn't mean that we can't have some civil debate, debate about it. I'm disappointed on some of the things that I have heard um, during this past session um, by some, just it's not the Democrats as a whole, individuals, and I hope we can move away from some of the partisan rhetoric and the sound bite pieces that people like to get out there and, and um, sit with each other, sit across, have discussions, not return to personal attacks because we disagree and realize that it's okay. I come from a large family and we have Republicans and Democrats and independents and libertarians and we get together quite often and we like to talk politics and at the end of the, our gathering, we're, we also give each other a hug and kiss goodbye until the next time and I, I certainly come from that that we can have a discussion, not agree and still be okay. Senator Dow. I, I thought the uh whole speech was uh, given in a positive tone. I appreciated that. Uh, a lot of promises were made. Uh, maybe five chickens in every pot. We've got to figure out where uh, all the money's coming from if we are to pursue that. But my goal is to always improve the economy so that that provides the funding for the things that we need to do in the state of Maine. Representative Dillingham, Senator Dow, thanks for providing the Republican perspective on the state of the state. Jen? And that was Mal Leary with uh, House Re uh, Republican Leader Kathleen Dillingham and uh, Senate Republican Leader Dana Dow. That's right. And that will conclude our coverage of Governor Janet Mills' first State of the State address for all of us at Maine Public. I'm Jennifer Rooks. Have a great night.